Hello, good morning, welcome back to my channel. So today I want to do a video talking about the fourth cognitive function and the role that it can play in your personality type. And I specifically want to go over this limiting belief, my first function and my first function only will get me what my first function wants. So I've briefly talked about this before in my annoying series, the series about how each of the types can be annoying. And I talked about this belief in some of those videos that your first function, your first function only can get you what your first function wants, or that's what people believe. But I wanna talk about how actually the fourth function kind of whispers at your life purpose and how your fourth function can actually really help you get what your first function really wants. I'm gonna start by taking some quotes from Carl Jung and John Beebe, and then I'll get into how I think this applies to each of the types. So I'll go through each of the types and give examples for how I think it applies to them. This video relies a little bit on a couple of past videos that I've done. So if you're interested in this topic, I did a video about introversion versus extroversion, which is really fundamental to this. Um, I did a video about cognitive function loops and the role between introversion and extroversion and the balances that are appropriate. Um, and then I also did a video about how each of the types can be at their best or at their worst, which is about differentiation, which is part of what is involved in here. So if you like this topic, those are some videos to check out because it definitely builds on some of those past videos that I did and I will have those linked in the description box. So let's go over some quotes. So Carl Jung talks about one-sidedness and this one-sidedness being if you're too heavy on the extroverted side or too heavy on the introverted side. So on one-sidedness and extroversion, he says, this is the extrovert's danger. He becomes caught up in objects, wholly losing himself in their toils. In the foregoing section, I emphasize the tendency to a certain one-sidedness in the extroverted attitude due to the controlling power of the objective factor in the course of psychic events. Then Carl Jung later goes on and he talks about the dangers of one-sidedness and introversion. The subject's freedom of mind is chained to an ignominious financial dependence. His unconcertedness of action suffers now and again, a distressing collapse in the face of public opinion. His moral superiority gets swamped in inferior relationships, and his desire to dominate ends in a pitiful craving to be loved, for a peculiar cowardliness develops from the sphere of the object. He shrinks from making either himself or his opinion effective, always dreading an intensified influence on the part of the object. These are two very harrowing pictures of what it can be like if you're too heavy on the introverted side or the extroverted side. And this is why I referenced my video on introversion and extroversion because a lot of people have a misunderstanding about what those words mean. So I, introversion does not mean that you stay home and watch Netflix and extroversion does not mean you go to a bunch of dinner parties and are a social butterfly. So if you wanna go back to that video and see what introversion and extroversion are, that'd be really important. Young goes on in the importance of both introversion and extroversion. He says, self and world are commensurable factors. Hence, a normal introverted attitude is just as valid and has as good a right to existence as a normal extroverted attitude. So he talks a lot about introversion versus extroversion is this difference between self and the world. In our society, introversion and extroversion are both valid. There's a reason that both introverts and extroverts exist, and that's because it's important that people are introspective and are tuned into what's going on inside them and processing things. And it's also important that people are externospecting, which means to watch what's happening outwardly and to um, impact the world externally and people and things. Um, so it's important that we have both introverts and extroverts in existence, but it's also important that within the self, you have parts of yourself that are introverted and parts of yourself that are extroverted because it's important that you are introspective within yourself, that you don't lose yourself in the world's toils, as he said, extroverts do in one-sidedness. And it's also important that you impact the world, that you you know, what are you gonna, if you have all this knowledge and this introspective qualities, you know, what are you doing with it? You wanna make your opinion effective. You don't wanna have inferior relationships or a peculiar cowardliness or a pitiful craving to be loved with moral superiority where, but the, where you talk the talk but can't actually walk the walk, you know? So this is important in both individuals. So I talked about in my loops video that really the biggest bang for your buck is that second function. That's really, if you wanna lean into a little bit more of self or world, depending on which one you're lacking, if you're an introvert or an extrovert, the second function is really where it's at because it tends to be neglected. That third function, talked about in that video, how it's so bratty and it um, really will pull you into one-sidedness. That third function is what pulls you into one-sidedness. So your second function, because it tends to be neglected, is really where you get the most bang for your buck. The only thing is sometimes it feels like it's not heavy enough of a hitter. So what I recommend is that you sprinkle in some of your fourth function. You don't try to, if you're an introvert, you don't try to become an extrovert. If you're an introvert, you don't try to become 50-50. Like you're not gonna become 50-50, that's not my advice. My advice is not even that you use your fourth function that often, but you sprinkle it in so that it helps your second function so that you're not so one-sided. I think it takes both your second function and your fourth function working together to kind of combat that one-sidedness. And so John Beebe says, the first function is our superiority complex and our fourth function is our inferiority complex. Um, 
so this this hubris with our first function, this is where I got this phrase, um, my first function and my first function only will get me what my first function wants. And so people just think that, you know, they've got this tool, their first function is this hammer, and when you have a hammer, you think everything's a nail. And so you think that your first function is the correct tool for every single job, but that's just really not the case. And people believe that their fourth function is a little worse than it is. Um, very People tend to be very sensitive with their fourth function. And it's true that it's not a strength, but it's not as bad as the individual feels that it is with this inferiority complex. So it's like Myers and Briggs said, your third and, four, your third and fourth function shouldn't be relied upon to make the big decisions. They're not the adults in the room. Um, like John Beebe calls the second function the parent, the third function the child. So the back two functions are kind of like these children. So you shouldn't really bring these children in to make the big decisions. However, they're still important members of the family. Like you don't let the children drive the car, but you don't throw the children in the trunk either. So Myers and Briggs said that sometimes, you know, you can bring them in, you know, they can, you know, you might bring the children in sometimes to help make a family decision, but they're not the final deciders. You know, you take their input, but they're not the final deciders. So, so I'll talk about how each of the types now can sprinkle in the fourth function. So for INJs, the false belief is vision and vision only will help me achieve this vision. I've been going through kind of the anchor words for these functions. And for INJs, it's NI. And the anchor word is vision. So vision and vision only will help me achieve this vision. And if I just think about this vision and understand this vision, then the vision will be realized. But that's actually, that's absolutely cannot be further from the truth because you have to do something to realize the vision. You have to actually um, SE do things in the world for the vision to be realized. And just because you've thought about it and you feel like you understand it and you've seen it from all these different angles, um, it doesn't mean that the vision's actually going to be realized. And just because you've thought about it very far in advance does not mean that it's actually going to become reality when you just sit there and think about it. Um, and especially what can happen with INJs is they really can neglect their bodies. You know, being sedentary all the time. Anyways, it ends up having bad effects. So what I recommend in sprinkling in some SE is you do it in kind of an NI way. You know, NI is who you feel like you are. So to go into SE feels like you're going away from yourself. So what you can kind of do is you can kind of uh, sprinkle in activities that hit on both NI and SE. So I'm gonna talk about some SE activities. Um, so one thing I've talked about before is like biking or insert exercise of choice while podcasting or while reflecting inwardly. So you do something that's kind of on autopilot. I like biking because it's kind of autopilot. And then you can podcast or you can learn things um, while that's happening. But you're moving your body while still, you can still kind of zone out. And I will allow you to zone out. You're doing this thing on autopilot. Another thing that I personally like um, is line dancing in Zumba. And I like these classes because you have to guess where the moves are going. Like for example, like if you go into like a Zumba class, you know, they do these moves, maybe they do the same move four times, but then they change. And I like the pattern recognition of recognizing the pattern of what moves were already done and trying to guess where it's going. Is this gonna be a dance? Is this gonna be a move for two counts? Is this gonna be a move for four counts? And I feel like it really gets me into future projecting a lot. Um, and so then that's really fun for me. Another one is a sports like volleyball uh, that allow you to see where it's going. A volleyball is a big ball and which I think helps when you're SE4. Uh, but it also moves relatively slow compared to a tennis ball or a baseball or a spike ball. Um, you can move a volleyball very quickly, but relative to other sports, it's a little slower. Um, especially like the bumping part and the setting part, those are kind of slow, slow, you know, the spike might be quick, but, um, and it's a, a relatively big court. So you have time to see where it's going and guess where it's going to be going. So I like sports like that, that a lot. That's kind of an NISE thing. And um, the last one is maybe like fashion trends. That's an SE thing, kind of guessing. Um, I like to guess sometimes what the shoe of the year is going to be. You know, every year I feel like there's some it shoe like the Nike 270s or Jordans or Nike Blazers or whatever they are uh, and kind of guessing what it's going to be. So anyways, I don't know if the fashion trends one is really that important, but those are just ways that you can integrate NI and SE kind of at the same time. I think it, uh, adding sprinkles of this helps you to actually achieve your vision because you need to be like healthy. When the long-term future vision that you have, when it comes around, you wanna actually be healthy when the time comes around. Um, you know, you're planning for a long-term future, but you forget that your body is going to be changing throughout that time. And so it's important to keep your body in line with things. Uh, for ETJs, the belief that they have is systems and systems only will get me good systems. And they think, you know, if I just learn the efficiency and ROI and do enough goal setting and do enough leadership and I read leadership books and da da da. So if I do enough of these TE things, then I'll have a good system and a good organization. But 
actually there's things that really fall apart when you only rely on systems and a lot of it becomes the emotional factor um uh, it become you know morals might become an issue or your own personal feelings or you know your your own personal feelings haven't cut up caught up to you in the pace that you're working at or maybe um the environment in the organization isn't good and so you know there's a lot of soft factors uh, that really will uh, throw off the system. And I think so sometimes ETJs are so focused on the hard science that they forget about kind of the soft science and maybe the relationship side. So for ETJs, I thought about, you know, they get a feeling wheel, which organizes the feelings, you know, kind of a feeling system. A lot of times they have like efficiency systems or money systems or things like that, but not feeling systems. Um, so feeling wheels, are, I think, are really important. I think being able to name emotions, um, you know, maybe developing a routine or something that every evening you're like, three emotions I felt today, or da, 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 and you can look at your emotions wheel and you can point to those things. Because I think sometimes ETJs have these deep feelings, but it's difficult to name them unless you have a list of them. Or another thing I've heard is every evening you could say, um, this is something you do with children who are just learning kind of um, emotional communication. And I think, you know, for an ETJ, FI is your like, it's your little baby function. So I think activities for children might be appropriate for an ETJ. Um, but it's uh, it's called mad, sad, glad. So what made me mad today? What's one thing that made me sad today? And what's one thing that made me glad today? And that's kind of, you know, kind of a basic thing. And I think it helps you kind of keep in touch with that thing and it's part of it's just part of the system so that it you catch it before things kind of get ahead of you um so i said develop a system for emotional time so that could be a journaling system with yourself a system for checking in with yourself like the mad sad glad that i said um a system for tough conversations um so for example there's this book i said like hwl so that's there's a book called how we love um and they have a template for tough conversations um i think I think there's a book called, is it called Crucial Conversations that I know an, ET, an ETJ that really recommends. Um, but yeah, systems for what to do during tough conversations. Um, but I think especially with yourself, I think the most important thing is developing a system with yourself and a journaling system. I think especially in an organization, I think ETJs probably already have systems in place for how do they have tough conversations with employees. But I think it probably is less likely that ETJs have a system for uh, themselves personally. Like when it involves leadership or maybe their family, maybe they have the system in place, but when it's just them as an individual, I think maybe not, they probably don't have the system for themselves. So, you know, a journaling system that you like, um, it could be a guided journal. There's a lot of guided journals out there. Um, one that I really like is it's called, I think it's called the therapy journal. I'll try to put a picture of it here, but it prepares you for, for like going to your therapy session. Um, and I think it'd be actually really useful even without going to a therapy session. You just kind of fill this in. I think that'd be a good thing for an ETJ. It's a good system. So for IFPs, the anchor word for IFPs is morals. And I'm not sure that I want to use this anchor word fully, but so morals and morals only will help me get more moral or what I want and only doing what I want will get me what I want. And I think that, you know, there's a couple issues with that. I think, you know, with IFPs, they're like, I'm just only going to do what I want, and that's my ethic, and that'll get me what I want. And I think sometimes they'll say, like, I don't want to go to college. I want to be a musician. I'm only going to do what I want. And But then the issue is then when you don't go to college and then you're not a full-time musician yet, then in the meantime, you have to work these odd jobs and you don't have a college degree. And so the selection that you have to choose from is not as good. And so you end up doing a lot of things that you don't want. But the professed ethic was, I'm only going to do what I want. The other thing is morals and morals only will help me get more moral. And so the idea is I'll just think about my convictions. I'll think about what feels right to me. And then I'll be the most moral person because I've just really thought about my morals. But a lot of uh, a good morality is taking action and, you know, kind of putting your money where your mouth is um, and actually, you know, doing things to contribute to things. So if there are causes you care about actually contributing financially as opposed to um, just talking about the thing. So, you know, actually taking action to make change, you know, just thinking about change doesn't enact the change that you want. So I was saying, so, so TE can really help you. So I said, get a task management system in place to get your time in alignment with your values. And I said, there's a system like Desire Map. So there's a book, there's a book and a planner called Desire Map. And it's plan how you want to feel. So this is a very TEFI thing. So they have a list of all these different emotions. And so you say like at the end of the year, how do you want to feel? And then you set goals in alignment with how you want to feel. And so you don't send, so you don't set like benchmarks, like I want to make this much money. You set benchmarks like um, I want to feel alive or I want to feel enlightened or things like that. And then you create a system for like, how are you actually going to feel that thing? Because you'll know you achieved the goal when you actually feel these things that you want to feel. I think something like the desire map is good for FI users because it's a blend of TE and FI. 
Um, and then I said, start volunteering or leading an organization that aligns with your values. Um, I was talking to Garrett, my husband, he's an ISFP, and I was asking him, like, how do you think it's good for IFPs to incorporate TE? And he said, you can't talk about TE without talking about leadership in some capacity. And um, so for him, like, what aligns with his FI values is, you know, worship leading um, and creating a very authentic atmosphere um, musically in a church setting, creating more um, authenticity in what can be kind of a religious environment. And so that's some of his values. Now he's leading in that regard. Um, but if you didn't want to lead an organization, you could start by volunteering in an organization. I know a friend who she volunteers with refugees, um, another one who volunteers with uh, cleaning up wildlife that have been like hurt like in oil spills or things like that. Um, so, you know, just something that aligns with your values, you know, get involved, uh, make a change, lead the thing. I think I think IF, IFPs really have a desire to lead and be out there with TE, but it's a little part of them. It, it's like whispering at their purpose. I mean, usually they might have these big desires, like they want to be an author, or they want to be a musician, or they want to be, and they want to be famous for those things and well-known for those things. I think that's TE whispering at things. They want to be leading something. They really have these strong values and they would like those values to be disseminated to others. And so I think it'd be really good for IFPs to get into volunteering and leading and working on some, working on some of the, just sprinkling in some of that tea. It doesn't need to be, you know, your whole life, but you know, just, you know, every Tuesday you volunteer at this place or, you know, you just sprinkle it in. So for ENPs, the belief is possibilities and possibilities only will help me get more possibilities. Um, and so I think ENPs, uh, they see the present situation, Carlin talks about, as like a closed room, which they feel like they need to be freed from urgently. Um, and so they're like, I need to try out this possibility. But then that possibility becomes a closed room. So they chase a new possibility and that becomes a closed room. Um, and so what happens is actually some of these possibilities end up becoming kind of chaining to the individual. You feel like a slave to these possibilities and you're actually losing freedom. Um, and depending on the level of recklessness with some of the possibilities, this isn't necessarily always the case, but I'm thinking of like an ENP um, who gambles a lot, and then he's now become a chain to that. What was once an exciting possibility, you know, that's now chaining him and hindering his freedom, and now because of uh, financial instability, he can't go do these other possibilities. So sometimes stability is actually the thing that enables you to get more possibilities. If you have a stable job, that can end up being a container for more possibilities. When your finances, finances are in check, then you can, you know, you can go travel and you can go do all these things. When you have good routines and good stability and, you know, a stable foundation, then that's a stable launch pad where you can, you know, launch and do all these possibilities. So I said for ENPs, um, one thing that I've seen a lot of ENPs do, I, ENTPs and ENFPs as well, um, is exploring bullet journaling. So I said you could explore bullet journaling as a new hobby and especially in a way that tracks your routines, water intake memories, etc. A lot of times if you look at um, bullet journal spreads, they track a lot of SI things, um, and a lot of it's kind of retrospective. Okay, what did I do today? What was my favorite movie this month? What type of shows was I watching? Um, and tracking routines, tracking mood. Um, and then, but it's a little NE because it's a new hobby. And it also, you can, you know, every month you get to create the spread. You know, you can make a new thing. Okay, I didn't like that spread this month. So next month, I'm gonna make a new spread. I knew an ENTP who was doing this for several years. I don't know if he's doing it anymore, but he was doing it for several years. And I think that was, you know, really good for him. Um, I said, so try a new type of routine. So like you could try a new type of workout. You could try a workout that you've never done before um, or a new gadget like a Fitbit which tracks your stats. So you get the new with NE, but with a little SI. So it might track your stats or your sleep or how many steps you've taken. And then another one similar to the bullet journaling was you could try a happy planner. Happy planner is a very SI thing in general, the whole community, a very SI NE. You've got, you know, there's so many stickers and a lot of the, a lot of the ways that people do it is they do it retrospectively. Um, so like the way I plan is kind of futuristically, like what am I going to do this week? But a lot of times with the happy planner, they'll do it retrospectively and they reflect on what they did that week and reflecting on the routines and things they did. So, you know, happy planner or bullet journaling, they both have big YouTube communities if you're interested in what those are like. And so when you then create the stable foundation, I think the more you, you know, if you track your routines or if you track your money or different things like that, that creates a more stable, solid foundation to where you can launch possibilities then from there. So for EFJs, the anchor word is harmony in Carl Jung's text. So we've got harmony and harmony only will help me get more harmony. And so I think they think sometimes that, okay, we're all getting along and we just make sure everyone's all getting along. And if we just make sure that everyone's getting along on the surface level, then everyone's getting along. But then sometimes these things will creep up 
and what was once a little issue then becomes a big issue. And I think that's actually, this belief I think creates a lot of drama in EFJ's lives. I see, um, I associate drama with um, an undeveloped FE. And um, sometimes it's, you know, the tough conversations um, briefly that really get to the root of the thing that then will create long-term harmony. The short-term conflict will create long-term harmony. And I feel like things that are hard in the short term, but good in the long term are what you want as opposed to the reverse. You know, you don't want the payoff now, but you have to pay for it later. So I said, you know, using some TI is good. So TI is very good at classifying things um, and finding nuance within things. Um, so you could use classification systems for relationships like conflict styles. So uh, one thing I'll put on the screen here is how we love. So you can take a quiz. It's kind of like attachment styles, but it gets a little bit more into conflict. And I would say it's more developed than attachment styles. So it was some counselors, they took attachment styles and they made it a little bit more in depth. Um, and so they take, you have these conflict styles, then you can see the cycles that can tend to develop when this type gets with this type. And that has been so fascinating. I think that was so fascinating for me. And I think that learning about, I think it's really good for EFJs to learn about things like cognitive functions, because they understand, oh, people are just different. It's okay, it's totally, it's okay. I understand people are just a little different. Or you learn about these like conflict styles, you're like, oh, okay, this makes sense. People are just different. And I think, you know, EFJs can be so sensitive to praise and criticism. And I think when you learn about things like this a little with some TI, then it's like, oh, okay. You don't have to take it personally, you know? Because I feel like EFJs do a lot of work for people around them. And I think it's hard for EFJs when they're not getting that back. And I'm very sympathetic to that. Um, so I said you could research topics within your FE interest. So a lot of, you know, a lot of times TI users are really researching and getting into depth and nuance. So, you know, you're, one of your interests, you know, I'm thinking about relationships, you know, conflict styles are one of those interests, but you know, whatever things are interesting to you as an FE user. Um, I, I know ESFJs who are really interested in brain science and how that affects your mood sometimes, um, or how the body affects it. So, you know, just researching topics that are in your interests. I, I've noticed FJs using uh, terms, like classification terms, like narcissism a lot and being interested in researching that type of thing. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, so yeah, just, I think researching topics. Uh, for ITPs, the anchor word that Carl Jung used over and over again was the word principles. Um, so I might use a couple different words, but in general, principles and principles only will help me be most principles. Or logic and logical thinking only will help me be the most logical. Or truth and truth only will help me be the most right, or things like that. I saw, I saw a quote one time that seemed like uh, TI out of balance with FE, and it said, never apologize for telling the truth. And I was just thinking that there's so much more nuance to that that, you know, like just because something's true doesn't mean it's right to say it. Um, you know, if someone's fat or whatever and you just call them fat or whatever, you know, it could be objectively true, but it's not, it doesn't mean you were in the right for saying it. You know, being in the right is different from being right. And I think there's some nuance there with TI users. Um, I think probably more common for TI second than TI first, but I think that they think that um, if I just have the most knowledge and I'm the most nuanced or whatever, then I'll be respected for having that knowledge. Um, but a lot of times you see a lot of FE users being most respected for having less knowledge than a TI user, much less research time was done, but they communicate it in a way that moves a room and will land with people. And so I think for TI users, it's, you know, the hard pill to swallow is you have to learn how to say things for them to be accepted. And I think a lot of times TI users, they say things in a way that doesn't land with people and they, don't and they don't understand why. And I think it takes some FE. And then once you have some FE, then you can actually get the respect that you want for being so knowledgeable and so principled. Um, and it's a matter of, I think, speaking, speaking more. I think for ISTPs in particular, you know, there's a lot of, um, they have a lot of knowledge and principles. And I think that they just don't feel like what they have to say is important enough to say. And they just feel like, well, when it's important enough, then I'll share. But there's a lot of, I think, wisdom within TI um, that I think would bridge the gap between people. So I said that to get in some FE, you could, to blend some of that TI and FE together, you could join in-person communities around common TI interests. And I specifically want to say not online communities like Reddit or Discord, but take it a step further. Um, like I've known a lot of STPs in disc golf. I ended up taking up disc golf and I ended up meeting a lot of STPs in the disc golf community. It's a very, it's a very TI FE community. I thought that was kind of interesting uh, for STPs in particular. Um, but getting in in-person communities around your common TI interests, I think sometimes 
you know, this inferiority complex. I think ITPs, they've expressed to me that they feel really awkward with their FE. And I do not perceive them nearly as awkward as they describe themselves to be. And I think it's part of this inferiority complex. Sure, FE is not a strength, but it's not, it's not as bad as I think that they think it is. And I think they feel quite awkward. But if you get them in a setting, a very TI setting, I think that'd be easier to make conversation. I think it's easier to make conversation around your TI topics. So if you're, you know, really interested in sailboats, join a sailboat group or, you know, whatever the niche is that you have a lot of interest in, join that group and do it in person so that you can get some, you know, people skills time working on FE. You can work on FE in a safe TI space. And I said, apply what you've learned to your relationships. I know a lot of TI users who have spent a lot of time studying dating, for example. And there are quotes in Carl Jung's writing that TI has a vague dread of the opposite sex. And I think that I, I've seen so many TI users um, be interested in dating and have conversations about dating and they've researched dating or they've done courses on dating or things like that. Um, but not necessarily applying those things or getting out there. Like, if I just learn enough, this is kind of the Enneagram 5 thing. If I just learn enough, then I'll be ready. But it's this always kicking the can down the road, never quite feeling ready. Um, and what's, you know, what's really going to get you, <laughs> I think, a good relationship, if that's something that you want, is just talking to people. I think it's, it's the very basics. I think, you know, in teaching, we talk, I've done a lot of learning about, like, is, is this student failing because they're having a knowledge issue or is this student failing because they're having an application of knowledge issue? And there's, anyways, there's all different types of issues that students can have. And I think for TI, the issue is not knowledge. It's not that you don't have enough knowledge, but it's typically the, um, the barrier is getting into it. I think one thing that I've learned, I like a lot of social deduction games where like one person's the murderer secretly and it's like a tabletop game and you're trying to figure out which one of you is by deduction and lying and that type of thing. This applies in games like poker as well. What I would do is whenever I had a really good hand in poker, then I would be like really particular about how I was playing things or if I'm the murderer in a social deduction game, then I'm really particular about how I'm playing things. But what I learned is then that's how people know that you're the murderer because then they're like, oh, now you're playing it really seriously, which I feel like seems obvious. But so then what you have to, not only when you have the best hand, do you need to be really particular, but when you have a bad hand, you also need to, that's when you also need to be, you know, doing that type of thing. And so I don't know if this analogy is really making sense, but I think that when ITPs feel that they have something important to say, or in this analogy, kind of like they're the murderer in the game, when they feel like they have something important to say, then they're gonna articulate it really, you know, properly, or maybe when they disagree with something, or when, we, when they get onto a topic that interests them, then they're like, you know, really active. But then when they are not interested in the topic of conversation, or they're kind of neutral about the thing, then they're just kind of sitting back and quiet. And so I think it's learning to, you have to play the FE game the whole time, not just when you're interested, but also when something that doesn't really interest you, when you're neutral, um, also, you know, engaging with people and smiling and, and speaking and speaking up and really showing yourself. I think this probably comes up a little bit more with TI third than TI first, but something I noticed with TI is really pointing out where they disagree. And I think it's a Myers and Briggs quote. They said, point out where you agree with someone before you point out where you disagree. And I think, um, I was talking to an FE user one time. I was talking to this, this girl. And anyway, she said something just like, I just egregiously disagreed with. I just like, couldn't believe it or whatever. Anyway, so my friend was here, she's an ESFJ and we were talking anyways. Later we go talk about it. And she's like, yeah, I think the way you said that probably wasn't very good. She's like, I think it's more about how you say it than what you say. Well, that's, that's, I mean, that's an FE skill just in and of itself. How you say it is more important than what you say. That's, you know, FE is very good at that, which that's like, ugh, it's so hard for me to, you know, swallow that. But I think maybe for ITPs, I can swallow it a little bit better than I can. And she was like, the other thing is find where you do agree with the thing. And I was like, I 95% of the way disagree with her. I mean, I have to search to find anything that I agree with that statement. And she's like, well, find the 5% that you do agree with and then manipulate the conversation in that direction. And I was just like, pff, my mind was blown. Just the way that FE sees things. If, you, if someone says a statement that you 95% of the way disagree with, find the 5% that you do agree with and then just move and, and you know, it's kind of this impressive evasive quality that FE has to just go away from the thing that they disagree with, which I don't know that TI users have to do that. But I think that skill of, if someone says something that's slightly wrong, frame it in a way that you overall agree with what they're saying. And then at the end, tack on that part that you disagree with. You know, if you only disagree with 5% of what they're saying, make it 5% of the talking time. And I think 
the amount the TI users will disagree with something is disproportionate to what they did agree with. Or, you know, for TI users, they see a video, they agree with 95% of it, but then they leave this big comment about the 5% that they disagreed with. And I think it's, it's disproportionate to how they actually see things. And Carl Jung talked about how it makes them appear that they're more like irascible than what they actually are. Uh, for ISJs, so let me caveat before you see the word memories here. Uh, the anchor words for Carl Jung were archaic and reserved. And then a word that I really liked was timelessness. But none of those words fit with this framework here. Um, and introverted sensing is an internal processing of sensory experiences. So one way that you internally process sensory experiences is memories, but that's not the totality of it. So I wanted to give a caveat that I don't like this word memories exclusively because there's also a lot of bodily things like we talked about in the any section about tracking water and tracking your routines and things like that. So this is not complete, but it's <laughs> with that caveat, that's what I put here. So memories and memories only will help me get more memories or, uh, you know, routines and routines only will help me have a healthy body. And so I think that sometimes SI is so focused on, uh, you know, these good memories of the past and things were so good in the past. And if I just continue to meditate and think about how good the past was, then I will have more of those in the future. But when you spend so much time meditating on the past, um, it hinders you from creating any new experiences or creating any new memories. You know, there's this part of memories that need to be created. And in order to create memories, you have to try new things. Or, you know, I did this thing in the past and I liked it. So if I just keep doing all these things that I did in the past, it'll continue to be great. But I think a lot of times the memories that SI users look back on, like the time they got married or when they had their first child or they bought their first home, a lot of times the highlight reel and the memory reel of your life is a lot of changes. And so by cutting yourself off from NE and possibilities and change, you're cutting yourself off from making some of those memories. You're cutting yourself off from that highlight reel of your life. And I think as I sometimes think, okay, I'm gonna get this stable foundation, I'm gonna get my routines going and I'll just get this stable routine. And once I have this stable routine, then things are gonna be good. But a lot of times, you know, you, you have this NE, this fourth NE, and it's like kind of whispering at your purpose and it's kind of whispering at what you really want in life and sometimes you know you you just got to try something new you got to get out of the routine and try a new possibility um and change is good sometimes you don't want to make a whole life you know defined by change or marked by change but you know just little sprinkles of it in your life uh, will actually help you make more memories of the memories that you want um so i said integrate new into the routine so you don't have to go completely any you can blend these two things any and si so I said you could routinely craft or you could routinely learn a new skill like the piano. Um, so I have a caution here. It must be new or it becomes routine without NE pretty quickly. So you want to change it up every couple of months. Like I'm thinking NE users will switch things up pretty much every couple of months. I would say maybe even shorter, like they try a new hobby, then try a new hobby, try a new hobby. So SI might start with NE. So they're like, okay, I'm going to learn the piano. So it starts out being new NE because it's like a possibility you're trying a new thing. But then you're learning piano for years and years and years and years and years. And now it's like eight years on. It's no longer an NE thing because it's it's not a possibility anymore it's just it's this routine that you build so but you know building a routine like so I think my grandma's an ISTJ and I would every week I would go over to her house every Wednesday and we would do pretty much an any thing so we would draw one week and then the next week we went line dancing and the next week we'd go on a walk and the next week we tried bullet journaling anyways we just tried all these we just would try all these do things so it was kind of it was part of the routine but it was new. So you can kind of build the NE into your routine. So then I said you could travel to a newish, same-ish place each year, like for example, Hawaii, but a different part each time. So it's part of this thing that you already know. It's part of this routine. It's part of this historical thing that you've already done, like going to Hawaii. So you kind of get the gist of it, but it's a little different because maybe you do a different island each time. You mix it up a little bit or something like that. I think sometimes any users will try something new and then they just go to that same exact place every single time, which I mean, that's kind of, I mean, it's kind of any kind of SI, but it becomes a little bit, the more you just have done it repeatedly and habitually, it becomes more SI. So yeah, when you do the same thing habitually, it creates stability and it does a lot of good things for you. And being an SI Dom, that's what you should do a lot of the time. You know, the vast majority of the time, you know, you should be doing SI. But if you really want to get more memories, um, you got to try new things. And then you'll really get more memories by trying these new things. And they're not all going to be wins. So they will be hits and misses. And that's okay. I think a lot of times for SI users, doing the new thing, like it's kind of hard to get them to tr do the new thing sometimes. But then after the fact, they're like, oh. And they talk about it kind of optimistically after the fact. You know, after the fact, it's like, oh, well, yeah, that was good. That was so fun when we did that. That was so fun. But it was kind of like pulling teeth to get them out to do the new thing initially. Um, but I think that... You know, just 
look back at all the things you've done, like, you know what, I liked it after the fact. You know, it is hard to, you know, get me out there to do it, but I do like it after the fact. So for ESPs, the anchor word that Carl Jung used was sensation. Or enjoyment was a really, uh, was a really popular word in his section as well. So sensation and sensation only will help me get sensations I want. Or enjoyment and seeking enjoyment only will help me get more enjoyment. And I think a lot of times when you're seeking enjoyment, especially in a very present sense and on the short term sense, sometimes it doesn't lead to a long term enjoyment. There starts over time, there become kind of long term consequences. So, you know, on the short term, maybe you're doing, oh, this job is really fun or whatever. It doesn't make that much money, but it, you know, it's just this fun hobby that I'm doing, you know, YouTube or something like that. But then on the long term, it's not making money. And then on the long term, you have long term consequences with like, how is retirement working and long term consequences like that. So you don't actually get long term enjoyment. Like you were seeking enjoyment, but you don't actually get the long term enjoyment. So some things I was thinking of that NI users do a lot is consuming like long form content, uh, podcasts, other long form content or books. And it could be about an SE thing. So whatever you find enjoyable as an SE user, uh, listening to more long form content about that thing um, and thinking about, you know, getting a little bit, you know, deep, deeper into the interest and seeing it from deeper angles and kind of lengthening the attention span. Not all the time. I think that, you know, you're an SE dom and that is where SE users really shine is this, you know, ability to be so present in the moment and respond accordingly. So you do not want to make a life marked by NI. You want to, you want to have a life marked by SE as a whole. But, you know, sprinkling in some NI because I think your fourth function kind of whispers at your purpose and what you want long term. And so another thing is you can make a vision for your experiences. So like me as an, like an NI, well, with TE, but as an NI user, I do a lot of like vision casting. I do a lot of journaling about what I want the year to look like and the quarter to look like and the five-year plan and 10-year plan and things like that. And I do a lot of visioning. And so I think as an SE user, that'd be really good to have a vision and for your experiences. Like your vision might be about different things than like my visions are. You can make yours about experiences. You could also make it more short-term. You know, you can make it more short-term, like this week. What do I want to experience this week? What do I want to experience this month? Or kind of like a, like a bucket list, maybe, if you want enjoyable experiences. What's my bucket list this week? What's my bucket list this month? What's my bucket list this quarter? And, you know, see how far out you can stretch that. And I think that um, incorporating some NI um, allows you to reflect on what the consequences of certain actions will be. And I think NI with SE helps you have an enjoyable present and an enjoyable future. The NI doms have a hard time having an enjoyable present because they're just kind of living in this future that they think is going to be enjoyable. And SE users have a hard time, you know, getting a future that's enjoyable because they're trying to make the present enjoyable. Luckily for the SE users, they can kind of pivot. And as the future comes closer, that'll become the present. And so then it'll be more enjoyable. So I think SE users have an advantage in that regard. So this belief, my first function and my first function only will get me what my first function wants, really ends up short-circuiting itself. And it ends up actually living being kind of incomplete. You know, your first function is attached to your fourth function. So to get what your first function wants, it has to be attached to that fourth function a little bit. And it helps balance out the one-sidedness that Carl Jung talks about with introversion and extroversion. You don't wanna become what you're not, but you wanna become the fullness of what you are. So it's not about becoming something that you're not, but it's about coming home to yourself and being what you really are and who you really are incorporate some of your fourth function. That is absolutely part of it. You don't want to throw it in the trunk and forget about that part of you. You want to, you don't want to put it in the driver's seat, but you know, you put it in the back seat, you put it in its car seat or whatever, the little baby function. And you know, it's a contributing member of the family. It's not as sophisticated at all as your first or second functions, but it's definitely something that's important. Um, so if you're interested in this type of thing about growing cognitive functions, um, I did a video about loops recently, which talks all about your second and third function and how that ratio should be. Um, I also just did a video about introversion and extroversion, defining those terms, which I think is really important for when you're talking about this type of thing, you know, introversion and extroversion is not <laughs> Netflix and dinner parties, as well as I did a video about all of the types at their best versus at their worst. And that has a lot to do with cognitive functions as well. So if you're interested in those, you can check those out. Those will be in the description box, as well as I have a playlist about each of the personality types. So if you're an INFJ and you want to know all the videos I have about INFJs, that will be in the description box. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for watching. Bye.